Go ahead and flip to James 2, James chapter 2, and we'll be in uh, just the first 13 verses there. Calling this no partiality, James 2, 1 through 13. Let's pray and then we'll just walk our way through the text. Our Father and God, we ask and pray with hope and eagerness that you would open our hearts to hear and apply that which your word proclaims this day. Help us to recall to mind each day that we are to be judged by the law of liberty, and this means we must be quick to make sure that we've lined up with it. Give us grace as we look to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, let's look at verses 1 through 4, and as usual, I'll just make some comments as we go, and then we'll work through uh, applying it. Verse 1, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious, that is, the Shekinah glory, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly, note that's the Greek word where we get synagogue. So if a man comes into your synagogue, your assembly, with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, the Greek word actually would, it means like shabby, war, you know, torn clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions? Or quite literally, have you not judged something separate among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Or in the Greek, evil reasonings? Have you not reasoned evilly (laughs) in in your mind? So that's the, that's the scenario. Christian conduct, Christian behavior, it obviously takes center stage as James, of course, challenges his readers to follow God's law with a single-minded obedience. That's really the whole point of his letter, in large part. So notice in verse 1, Jesus is glorious. That's a clear reference to the Shekinah glory of God. Jesus is glorious, the glory of God in the flesh. James roots He roots faith and obedience in this glory, and it's the glory that only belongs to Lord Jesus Christ. In the Greek, there there are uh, different ways of talking about a noun. Um, Halagos would be the word in Greek, like from John chapter 1, verse 1. But here there is no uh, definite article. It just means Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, don't... Don't you hold your faith in, in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. There's an, uh, he's asserting supremacy here. But for James, there's a type of faith that's dead, a type of faith that manifests itself in the issue of partiality, or what we call favoritism. Um, playing favorites is, is the idea here. The example here he uses is, is pretty obvious. It's rather pointed. There's a rich man and there's a poor man. And the two are in the assembly, and you should know, and I mentioned this already, that a word assembly is synagogue. So presumably the early Christian church, remember James was probably written, I think it was written before Galatians, but there's debate on what was written written first, but it was written very early. And the early Christians took this understanding of church over against ecclesia. Remember, Jesus used the word ecclesia. And the ecclesia is simply a more Greek or Hellenistic understanding of a a political body, a a local political body. And so in large part, those were the ideas that they were working with. But here's this very Jewish understanding of the church being like a synagogue. They're in a synagogue. And of course, we know that's where Paul went to proclaim the gospel. That's where the early Christians gathered. They were very interested in a synagogue model of what it means to have a Christian social order. So we'll come back to that in in a little bit. So this church, there's apparently a trial situation or it's a church worship situation. Um, We don't actually know. Scholars are divided on the scenario that James is, is positing here. I tend to lead more towards this being a church trial situation because of the context of what we're dealing with. Um, But I don't, you know, there's just a division over that. We don't know. But what we know is if it is a trial situation, then we already know that the trial is already unfair. They're already showing favoritism toward the rich man. The poor man is told to either stand in the back or sit at the footstool, which would be a place of, of a servant or a slave. 
someone who is um, obviously uh, in a position uh, inferiority in, in those types of things. They're not sitting at the same level. Jewish law required you to sit at the same level. If you're going to be judged and adjudicated accordingly, there had to be a, uh, a no respecter of persons. The passage Seth read, there was obviously in God's law, partiality based on socioeconomic standards or race or whatever, or title, just because of the president, you're the president doesn't mean you, you know, you're above the law, which, you know, in our country, you kind of are. But so, so it is. So there's a, there's a situation here. If this is a church trial, it's already unjust. They've already just walked in the door, and there's already injustice happening here. So the rich man, he gets special treatment. The poor man is treated like scum. They have quite literally divided the body of Christ. And so the division, though, is between profession and practice. We have a faith that professes equality in Christ, yet it establishes rank and wealth as practical means of differentiation. That type of faith is at odds with the Christian gospel. Yeah, we, you know, we, we just were kind of talking about it earlier, but the issue of with IVF and... Um, vaccines and kind of how all these things are tied to the abortion industry and you have an issue of, of um, ageism, treating people, people differently, Th this idea of partiality and Christians are not to be partial people. We aren't to show favoritism. We aren't, we aren't supposed to just get comfortable with one sort of way of doing things and then you know, uh, uh, you know, buck against the system when someone tries to challenge you in, the, in that way. So in short, James is saying, if your behavior, if your Christian conduct demonstrates partiality or favoritism, James says essentially that this person, the person who's doing that, is living more like the persecutors of the church than living like Jesus himself. So if you're going to name the name of Christ, the glory of Jesus Christ, you have to know that partiality is incompatible with, with that name. If you name the name of Christ, partiality is incompatible with that name. Look at verses 5 through 7. This is his theological argument. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? The Greek word is actually, there's plural, the courts. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? So this is James's theological argumentation to deal with the problem. To start, Jesus, God has chosen the poor to inherit the kingdom of God, which is basically exactly what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, which is Luke's version in Luke 6.20. He said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Luke's gospel spends a lot of time explaining how the poor are rich in faith. There's, that theme is all throughout Luke's, uh, Luke's gospel. In the Old Testament, God showed special interest to the poor. Uh, Deuteronomy 15 is one example. Psalm 35.10, Proverbs 19.17. God clearly had an interest in the poor. Um, and the poor were the focus of, of gospel proclamation because the poor essentially lacked the power and privilege and thus they were unable to better their condition due to the oppression. You should know that the poor, we're talking about people who were literally dehumanized at all levels in Roman society. And, and actually it's interesting because women were also treated in that same camp by and large. So the gospel was for Jesus to say, blessed are the poor, because the kingdom of God is for you. He's, there's something there. There's something there in the way God views things. Poor, they suffered, poor people suffered at the hands of systemic injustice in the Roman Empire. And the gospel, of course, we know deals with such things. They are economically poor, James says, but in Christ they are rich in faith. And so what's the warning? Don't misplace the glory. Verse 1, the glory is in Christ. Don't misplace the glory, which is what the rich can do quite easily. They put the glory in the wrong place. They put the glory in the riches. It's supposed to be in Christ. So James remind, reminds the Christians that the rich, that is the unbelieving world, 
A lot of times James is critiquing the rich as unbelievers. They oppress, they drag people into the courts, all the while, the whole, the whole way, blaspheming the name of Christ. And the rich, of course, they can afford to fight, while the poor can only suffer. But it is not so to be those with those in Christ. You know, I, I think of, just off the top of my head here, I think of the injustice system, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, but we have situations where people who, for example, get a traffic ticket, their car is taken from them, and then they can't go to work, and so the fines keep adding up because of our injustice system. They just keep piling on interest rates, and suddenly, you, you're, what can you do but declare bankruptcy? What can you do but just give up and stop fighting? Those are the types of injustices that, you know, how we can apply it today. But the irony here is that we're talking about the Christian assembly, that Christians are showing partiality, and Christians who show partiality are basically judging as the world judges, not as God does. And that's, that's the, um, this is the throat punch moment of James. <laughs> you are doing what the world does. And this is discordant. It's incongruent with Christian faith and practice. It doesn't add up. Christians do not play favorites. We don't take bribes. We want righteous judges in our nation who are not corrupted, who want to uphold the rule of law. And the law we want, of course, is God's law. But we don't want people who are in it to, you know, please the lobbyists, see who can pay off the senators to pass these vaccine mandations. Those are, that's injustice. That is favoritism. And that is not the way the Christian gospel works. Look at verses 8 through 11. If, however... You are fulfilling the royal law, and literal translation of that in Greek, the king's law, or the law of our king. If you're fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So we have a theological argument. Now James quotes scripture. James is giving us a scriptural argument here for his doctrine against partiality in the church of Jesus. The royal law, the law of the king, is all about loving your neighbor as yourself. It's summed up in this command. That's just the way Jesus phrased it. It's the way Paul does in Galatians. What is the, how do you summarize the law? Love others, love your neighbor, love them lawfully, treat them lawfully, those types of things. So the law of God is the king's law, the king's law. And by showing partiality and favoritism, these Christians were, in a sense, they they were breaking the commands of God. They were breaking the law of God by playing favorites. In other words, favoritism isn't loving your neighbor. Now someone, they, however, might object to this by saying, look, it's not that big of a violation of the law of God. After all, I am a really good person and I keep the rest of the law. I vote (laughs) pro-life. I do righteous things. I help crisis care pregnancy centers. Uh, and I, you know, that's a good thing. We, we, we think that they can play a role, no doubt. But what does James says? If you break even one of God's laws, you have broken them all. You've broken them all. The law is like glass, right? It's either broken or it's not broken. You, you, the, you can't halfway break a sheet of glass. Um, I worked in a window manufacturing company in Philly when I first moved there. And um, we broke a lot of glass. (laughs) And you don't fix that. You you don't um, pick the glass up off the floor and then glue it back together. When it's broken, especially if it's tempered glass, it shatters and it's done for. That's God's law. When God's law is violated in even just one iota of it, you have broken the entire thing. The glass is broken. So James, he uses this scriptural argument 
And he pulls from the Ten Commandments. You know the Ten Commandments. You're not supposed to murder. You're not supposed to commit adultery. So he goes straight for the, the Big Ten. He demonstrates his point. You might be faithful to your spouse. You might be faithful in, in, in not committing adultery, but you also may be a murderer. That type of person is a lawbreaker. And, and when we show favoritism while we're denying justice to the poor, to the least of these, Christians are essentially, this is James's argument, Christians are essentially killing the man because they're piling on oppression. Why does he use adultery and murder? Because in this situation, you may be right and you might be the most faithful person, but the way you show favoritism and treat people, you're killing people. You're destroying their lives, which is what our current justice system, <laughs> justice system does. It destroys people's lives. For the early church, they believed quite readily that Jesus was dead, but he's now alive, and he's very much alive in heaven, ruling and reigning. He's putting his enemies under his feet. And this king's law, the royal law, is less about answering questions on a test and more about love and compassion towards those who cannot help themselves. It's, it's not about counting how many transgressions you have collected and then, of course, comparing it with how many righteous acts that you've accumulated over the years. Those are, that's Islam in a nutshell. You hope that it outweighs the other. It's about fellowship. It's about true faith. It's about an, an insistence on the gospel, which, is, which establishes everyone equally. Look at our final two verses, 12 and 13. James says, so speak and so act. Notice, speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless, merciless to, to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over, or rather boasts against, judgment. Here's the final appeal, friends. Speak and act. Speak and act. And given the arguments laid out, one should speak and act as a person who is going to be judged by the law of liberty in the future. This is a, this is a mind-blowing passage to me. You should act and you should speak as those who are going to stand before the living God. And you will be judged according to the law of liberty. The king's law will be placed before you and you will have to answer to him. This is like an... This is like, um, I'll call it eschatological wokeness. <laughs> you, there's a future plan where God reconciles all things, and part of that reconciliation is judgment, and that judgment will be placed before you. So live like that's true, because it is. Live like it's true. We, when we speak and we act in accordance to God's law, we are ensuring that our behavior is thus aligned with God. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful for you will be shown mercy. He also said this in Matthew 7, 2, In the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, you reap what you sow, and God will always see to it that the reaping will match the sowing. That's the principle. Mercy triumph, triumphs over judgment, which is to say, by merciful acts, God's judgment is deterred. I mean, think about it. When we think of evangelism or teaching people the gospel or, you know, wherever, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that's an act of mercy towards the person you're talking about. The unbeliever doesn't know that, right? They don't know. But you standing before them and boldly sharing the gospel, it could be with a guy at work, who knows what the situation, that's an act of mercy. Mercy boasts against judgment, um, mercy is much more preferable than judgment. So do that. Extend mercy to each other. When we exhibit God's judgment in all of our affairs of life, dispensing rather liberally things like uh, mercy and justice, what God's word promises is that God is going to give it right back to us. He's going to give it. By the measure you use, will be measured against you. So make sure the measuring spoon is the right one. Make sure it's right. Make sure the standard's right. The ruler that you use to judge others better be the same ruler that God has in his hands. Now, let's apply this. When, when we think about theonomy, God's law, 
theonomy and God's applica the application of God's law, many, of course, are prone to rush to things like the death penalty for the crimes committed. Um, uh, sort of a bad rap on the theonomist because, oh, you just want to, you know, want to kill people. <laughs> Now, that is a biblical concept, and we do believe in the death penalty for certain things, of course. But many want to start immediately with the civil magistrate and his particular function, which is a biblical function, and we agree. We, we want the magistrate to be righteous, upholding God's law. We're, we're right there. It's very important. But we need to keep in mind that God's law, of course, covers every area of life, including how we treat our brothers and sisters in day-to-day -day relations. This is a synagogue situation. James did not pull, uh, you know, Caesar Augustus and, and or, um, you know, the, 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 the emperors, they do this and it's unjust. He's not talking out there. He's talking in here. This stuff in the church, in the synagogue. However, we can say this too. Before God's law is, gets out into the streets, God's law must be treasured in our hearts. And God's law is not treasured in the church here in America. It's not. Which means that we want a particular brand of theonomy. We want God's law. But we want the ethical nature of God's law before the application of God's law. Right? God's law has to be used correctly. has to be used right. So what is the brand of theonomy we're looking for? Well, this is it. We want a theonomy that's low, not high. We want a theonomy that's low, not high. We want God's law to, the, to be the defining characteristic of our actions and our relationships, what we say and what we do. He says, speak and act in light of the law of liberty. That's sanctification. That's what we should do. But like Jesus, who stooped low to redeem us, we want a particular version of God's law that has stooped just as low as the Savior who gave it to us. There are false applications of God's law, as exemplified here in James's scenario, that he warns against. And then there are true applications of God's law, which require Holy Spirit implementation in the lives of its adherents. Without the Spirit of God... There's no freedom. Without the Spirit of God, there's no law of liberty. There's a connection here. But our theonomy must be low, and by that I simply mean it must be humble, it must be, pract it must be practical, and it must be manifestly other-centered. It must manifest itself in the lives of service towards other people. That's the theonomy we need. It has to be low. What do we mean by low? God's law cares deeply about those who suffer un under the weight of man's law. Plain and simple. God's law cares deeply about those who suffer under the weight of humanism and humanist law, man's law. See, this connects to what James has already been hin hinting at, which we'll get to in the next section, of course, as the issue of a true faith, an alive faith. That what, what did the Westminster Confession say? A true and lively faith and a false faith and a dead faith. Those are the things that, that are at play here. The basic issue is this. There is a faith that's dead. However, it's dead and it still tries to attach some veneer of justice to it. It still tries, right? Um, it, it, it still, uh, I, I, I have this theory that we should stop, all traffic stops should stop immediately. If I was president, Let's stop pulling people over altogether. You know, we could talk about the details later, but let's say we did something crazy like that, right? You know, there are repercussions. You know, how, how, well, then what are police supposed to do? You can stand there and wait till we need you. <laughs> um, God's law is, is low, it's humble, it's practical, it's other centered, it seeks the benefit and mercy of people, and it cares about those who are oppressed. It cares about those who suffer under the weight of, of man's law. But it's a, it comes from a dead faith. Man's law comes from a dead faith, but they still try to call it justice. They, they still try to do something in the world. The people that James rebukes, they're part of the culture of the synagogue, the church. They're apparently Christian people. They name the name of Christ. 
but they're severely misguided Christians who are just repeating the same errors as, as man's oppressive laws. They believe in a power religion. They aren't holding to the law of liberty and freedom, but they're instead holding to the law of oppression and slavery and injustice. And for James, this, this behavior is ludicrous. It's ludicrous. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell anybody. But apparently James is a social justice warrior. <laughs> Gasp, we can't be having any of that. Apparently James cares about justice in the synagogue. As we've seen already, God's law, God's law is a law of liberty. He's called it that already several times. And, and here he calls it the, the royal law, the king's law. And this is liberating because it puts us all on the same level of adjudication. It puts us all on the same level. Whether you're the president or a, a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company or, or you, you know, sweep floors for a living, whatever you do, it puts all of us on the same level of adjudication. There's no favorites in God's law. There's no partiality. He judges us all the same. See, the rich can't boast, and they're thus brought low because their riches can't go with them to eternity. So what, you're a billionaire. You can't take it with you. They're brought low. And then we, of course, have the poor who are brought up. They're brought high because in Christ they are rich. See, the king's law, therefore, is the great equalizer. It's the great equalizer. It's, it has no respect for, it's no respecter of persons. God's law is an indiscriminate. It applies everywhere equally. But man's law is highly discriminant, right? It's not indiscriminate. It's, it's, it's discriminant. It applies everywhere differently. Who can pay, right? Who can pay? Who can hire the best lawyers? Who can get the best lobbyist in, in there in D.C. to write the best laws? What, what pharmaceutical company can we, can we tap on shoulders to go and donate to, to Senator Pan or Pan I'm not, in California? The, the guy who's you know, really pushing these man, mandatory vaccinations. Like, who can we pay off these backdoor politics? That is injustice. And the sin of partiality is sin because of this differentiation. Now, <clears throat> partiality is obviously what characterizes our current injustice system. Men and women are locked in cages while taxpayers foot the bill, many because of nonviolent crimes related to possibly carrying around in a little baggie a plant. We have a corrupt court system from top to bottom. The Supreme Court is the de facto place where the buck stops. And our local courts, of course, they simply just tow the line. Well, whatever the Supreme Court says, we have to enforce. We call this judicial supremacy. Um, I'm just doing my job is the same old refrain because of an overabundance of cowardice and a short supply of courage. Why are you pulling me over today, officer? I'm just doing my job. So you have no conscience? You have nothing that drives you towards justice and mercy. See, not many in the political arena have the conviction to stand for justice. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to argue that it's because the church is in the very same predicament. Cowardice Christians lead to, leads to cowardice out there. When Christians are cowards, politis, politicians are cowards, legislators are cowards. When Christians give themselves over to cowardice, the world follows. The world follows. And James makes the theological and the scriptural argument here. God has chosen to set his, his love and his salvation on the poor because they're the ones who suffer injustice the most. And not only that, he argues, isn't it the rich, unbelieving world that oppresses you? Aren't they the ones who blaspheme the name of Christ that was given to you? The name that was stamped on you at your baptism? Aren't they the ones that blaspheme God? And while we're at it, James says, well, don't you realize that you yourselves are going to be judged by the royal law? So why wouldn't we seek justice? Why wouldn't we seek judgment properly? Why wouldn't we get it right here so that the world can figure out how to get it right? Why wouldn't you want mercy to triumph over justice, especially if you want that to be the case for yourselves? 
See, it's my conviction that the partiality that we see in our current injustice system stems from the sin of partiality taking place in our churches. And James saw the very same thing around him. That is a scathing indictment on whoever received this letter. <laughs> Here's what you're doing in your churches. You're treating the rich man very well, and you're treating the poor like the scum of the universe. How do you expect the world to get it right when we can't get it right in here? If it's true that the synagogue, that is the church, is a social order that is meant to reflect God's kingdom, then it follows that our obedience to that order will infiltrate, disarm, and redirect the world's version of order. That's the logic. Why does Cross and Crown insist on so many things? You guys are just haters and talking about vaccines and abortion and IVF and what is wrong with you people? Well, we want to we want to get it right in here. <laughs> we want the church to be healthy, to be courageous, to be bold, not cowards who who who, who cower in fear of of statist res, regimes. We don't want to kowtow to China. <laughs> You know, the Hong Kong church there needs, they need our prayers, they need our help, they need, they need to stand strong. They want justice. We want justice. See, the world longs for power, wishing to obtain it at every single, and at any cost. And the reason is so that it can wield it at any cost. There, there is no governor on the pursuit of power. It doesn't get tapered off because, oh, I just want to be nice. If you don't have the Holy Spirit... You don't have a governor. You're just, you're gone. You know, you're going to, without the spirit, there, there's, no, there's no stopping to the madness. Men will grasp and grasp some more, wishing to have dominion over other men. Power, power and authority become this means to a villainous end, right? More and more authority, more and more power, more and more oppression, more and more laws. I think it was Chesterton who said, if we won't be governed by Ten Commandments, we'll be governed by thousands. This is the lording it over that Jesus warned against. But Jesus, we know, gives us an entirely different ethic. We are not to judge like the world judges. We are not to esteem those who the world has rejected and reject those who God has esteemed. We're not, we're not looking to the world for how to exercise wisdom and discernment. This is folly. This is unloving towards your neighbor. The different ethic... This different ethic for living has everything to do with the nature and purpose of the gospel message. And, and I just have to say this because I know you've talked about this, Jordan, a bit too, but many Christians today, they are simply unable to see the connection between the gospel of the kingdom and things like justice and righteousness. And so you have people like MacArthur and other men who, who in a lot of ways I respect, but in another way, they, they don't see the connection. The gospel is just truncated down to this is how I get to heaven when I die. They don't see the fuller picture of the kingdom that speaks to matters of injustice. See, we get that the gospel message makes us right with God, but we fail to see the implication of that justification as it pertains to interpersonal relationships in society at large. We just don't see the connection. And the reality is this kingdom ethic is intended to permeate everything. We're supposed to see people as image bearers of God, worthy of our love and service, because that's what they are. We're supposed to extend mercy because in Christ, mercy has been extended to us. That's the ethic. There's simply no room in the church for favoritism or partiality. There's no room in the church for us being completely inept to give a solution and answers to the problems the world faces. But the, but the way the church functions, by and large, you get it. You've seen it before. You, you can see that it's the case. You know, pastors who are treated like they're God's greatest gift to mankind. <laughs> um, elders and pastors who dictate and control. They hold the center of power and authority in the local church. That's where the buck stops with whatever they say. Membership is held tightly because if you, don't, you know, if you don't sign this document, you're not a part of the kingdom, apparently. Those types of things. You've all seen it before. 
Thanks to pietism, we have this upper echelon of super Christians over there and us regular, you know, stir crazy abolitionist Christians over here. And all this stems from a departure from grounding, from our grounding and what James says and he emphasizes right in verse 1. James chapter 2 verse 1 is one is a very profound piece of scripture. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. The emphasis of James is the fact that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, he is the only true premise of all of our thinking and all of our doing. Did you catch that? He's the only true premise. That's it. There's no knowledge apart from Christ. And not any knowledge that's justifiable anyway. There's no justice apart from Christ. There's no glory to be had in the created order apart from Christ. That's the grounding. That's the starting point. When we depart from this grounding, when we walk away from this foundation, when we think that our faith is to be grounded in something other than Christ and His royal law, we will inevitably walk down the path of partiality. We'll be crippled by the fear of man. And thus, will people please? I can't talk about that topic in our church. People will stop tithing. And then our building mortgage will you know, get flipped over and the bank will take it. And then what? Our brand will diminish and no one will come in here. No, no. Maybe the most God-glorifying thing is that that takes place. <laughs> so we're crippled by fear of man. We, we tell people what we think they want them to hear. We, we loosen the belt of truth because we don't want to appear too uptight. See, when we compromise an inch by showing special treatment or neglecting others, we are at risk of being judged by that same standard. And let me tell you, that should, that should strike fear in us. It should strike fear in us that God may just judge us the, us the same way we judge others, wrongly. Finally, James, he wants us to be grounded in Christ with a loyal faith, an alive faith, and obedience to his royal law. And this means being cognizant, of course, about the self-giving nature of life in Christ. At every single turn, at, 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 every day, we have, even kids, every day, you have an opportunity to extend mercy and grace and dispense it as a pure reflection of the gospel. So be governed by the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Be governed by that. Let that dictate your actions as you speak and as you act. Show mercy, because in showing mercy, we are actually reflecting. We're reflecting the overwhelming mercy of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your text, your word, your spirit-inspired law that is a joy to read, is a joy to, to expound upon, God, your word is, is precious. And it's precious because it's the revelation of you. You have sent your son, and Father, you and the son have given us your spirit, and you have given us what we need for faith and godliness. So I pray, God, that we would speak and we would act in accordance to that. That you would, in fact, wake up the church to repent of the sin of partiality, to repent of double-mindedness, to turn away from, from this thinking that, that mercy is, is something we should hold on to for ourselves but not give to others. We know that your Spirit is here, that he is to, to guide us, to illuminate our minds. God, help us to, to know your word so that we can speak and we can hear and we can do accordingly. And we ask this, of course, in Christ's name, who is our King, who has given us his law. Amen.